case you didn't hear, uh, Dave Morrell led a team of, of five others out to Oklahoma to help with the cleanup and things are going well. Dave sent an email to us to let us know that they're staying there at a church and are working directly with the Red Cross and they put them in charge of a lot of the cleanup and are tickled to death that they showed up with a bobcat. So they're going to be there most of this week, so please keep them in your prayers. Ivan the Great was the Tsar of Russia during the 15th century, and he brought together the warring tribes into one vast empire, the Soviet Union. As a fighting man, he was courageous, and as a general, he was brilliant. However, Ivan was so busy with his war campaigns and, and doing all these different things, he didn't have time for a family. And so his friends and advisors were quite concerned. And they reminded him that not only did he not have a wife, but more importantly, he didn't have an heir. And because of that, this new union was going to be in jeopardy. And so he told them, I, I simply don't have time to go find a wife. But if you can, can search for a bride and find a suitable one, I'll marry your sight unseen. And so his counselors and advisors searched all the capitals of Europe to find an appropriate wife for the great czar. And find her they did, a beautiful, dark-eyed beauty. She was the daughter of the king of Greece. And she was young, and she was brilliant, and she was charming. And the king of Greece was also delighted. Because with this marriage, it would align Greece with this growing superpower to the north. And so everything was set. But there was only one condition. The king said, he cannot marry my daughter unless he becomes a member of the Greek Orthodox Church. And so they reluctantly went back and told the czar. And Ivan said, I'll do it. So a priest was dispatched from Greece all the way up. Uh, to Moscow to instruct Ivan in the Orthodox doctrine. And he became a, a quick student and quickly learned his catechesis in, in record time. And when his training was complete, all that lacked was for Ivan to make his way to Greece for his baptism. And so he prepared for the journey and he took with him 500 of his trained men. These were the palace guards that were most loyal to Ivan. And sure enough, when they arrived, his soldiers, loyal as they were, asked to be baptized along with the great czar. Well, the patriarch of the church kind of scrambled and pulled together 500 priests from, from around the area to come in and to work and kind of do a catechism crash course for these soldiers. And after it was done, the plan was all 500 of them would be immersed at one time in a mass baptism. So word got out and crowds gathered from all over the country to come see this. 500 priests and 500 soldiers all walking into the blue Mediterranean Sea. And, and the priests, if you can imagine, are, are dressed in, in black robes and they got their tall black hats. And the soldiers likewise were in their dress uniforms with all their regalia. But there was only one problem. In their time of teachings, the soldiers were instructed that the church prohibited professional soldiers from being members. They would have to give up their occupation, their commitment to bloodshed, because the, the priest had told them that you can't be a killer and also be a member of the church. Well, the soldiers got together, and they fi figured out they were at an impasse unless they could come up with something. So they devised a solution. And while the priests led them in and were saying the words were about to baptize them, as they were being lowered in, each man grabbed the sword from his scabbard and held it high into the air and allowed them to be baptized but still kept their fighting arm and sword above the water. Isn't that great? Because what they were thinking is, well, I can have the best of both worlds because I can be in the church, but I can still have my own will. I can be in the church, but still be in control. I can still be in the church, but maintain my life. And what, what a kind of a powerful metaphor for the church today. I wonder how many unbaptized arms there are. How many hearts have been completely given over to God? Have we been completely washed in the blood? Well, in preparation for this sermon series on dying to self, I picked up a couple of books that are they're kind of compilations of all the red letters that you see in the New Testament. 
And I thought it'd be great listening to just the words of Jesus and kind of listening to the Messiah, allowing him to, to kind of shape what I was thinking about this series on dying to self. And what I've found is his words are difficult, especially if you take them in, in one big block. And they'll mess up. They, they will. And I, I wrote in just a few things. Do good to those that hate you. Okay? I came not to be served, but to serve. Stop sinning or something worse will happen to you. But I say forgive 70 times 7. Whoever wants to be first must become last. Deny yourself daily. That doesn't sound like much of a life. And we keep talking about that, that, that Jesus has his life for us, but that sounds hard. Being a follower as Jesus described it, this discipleship is hardcore. It, it's like double espresso discipleship, right? And as I'm reading through, I, I kept looking for the caramel frappuccino version, you know, a little, little bit sweeter, uh, not, a little less costly, less intrusive way of following Jesus something that was more sensible, something more practical. You know, we just kind of come to church from time to time and we drop something in the plate every once in a while and, and, and maybe find something to do around the church. Uh, it's something that is, is tangible and something that you can kind of judge how you're doing and others are doing, you know? Something that's familiar, something that's predictable and still leaves 95% of the, our waking hours for us to do whatever we'd like. I mean, talk about user-friendly. Well, that's what I was looking for, but the only problem was it wasn't there. And so if you start looking at discipleship, as Jesus describes it, and, and we see this ideal, and we're confronted with the truth, we really only have a couple of options. What do we do when we see kind of how we've defined it, but then we see how Jesus defines it? Well, the first thing we can do is we can look at others. We can look at the girl that's in the, the cubicle next to us, or we can see kind of our crotchety neighbor across the street, or we can look at Dennis Rodman and say, you know what, if, if God is grading on a curve, there are plenty of people on the back end of the curve. I'm doing pretty well if I compare myself to them, right? It's probably unfair to Dennis Rodman. He may have a relationship with God that I don't know about. But, uh, you know, j just think about this. And so you, you think, well, if I continue to live my life this way, I may not have box seats for all of eternity like the gung-ho tights, but at least I'll be in the bleachers. I know these guys won't, but I'll, I'll be in the bleachers. And so that's kind of the way we start rationalizing. But the other thing that we can do is we can look to Jesus and we can wonder. Wonder what life would be like if we truly gave him everything. If we gave him our heart and said, Lord, this is it. I, I'm just giving it to you. What's life going to be like? And, you know, we've encountered people that have done that and, and people that have taken this latter path that have surrendered all and they have no regrets, right? Well, if, if that's true, then why don't more people give it a try? Well, because it's hard. It's much easier to just kind of settle for less. G.K. Chesterton said this, the Christian ideal has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left untried. We, we look at what Jesus is, is, is calling us to and we just say it's too hard. I, I'm not even going to give it a try. I'll settle for what I see other people doing around me. And so we forego what has been offered up by Jesus Christ. So it's hard soaring through our thoughts, our feelings, our motives, and truly dying to ourselves and, and, and asking ourselves, am I living for God and giving him everything? And so we settle for less. Turn with me, if you have your Bibles, to Acts chapter 5. And as you're turning there, I'll kind of give you, bring you up to speed on what's been happening in the first four chapters. As you know, in Acts chapter 1, Jesus is ascended back to heaven. And so he tells his disciples to go in Jerusalem and wait. In Acts chapter 2, they found out what they were waiting for. The Holy Spirit comes on them in a very powerful way. And so Peter goes out and preaches a sermon of a lifetime to the crowd and convicts them of their sin and putting Jesus on the cross. And that day, 3,000 people give their hearts to the Lord and are baptized. And so overnight, the, the church just springs up. 
and, and that sounds good, but they still got to figure out how to do church and, and how to do all these different things. And so they start scrambling and they start living as a community. And they start caring for the needs of the poor and also caring for the needs of, of those who have come from out of town for the feast who just decided to stay. And so from time to time, when the people helping funds kind of run out, well, then someone would go sell a, a piece of property or, or they would go and sell a possession. And, and the proceeds from that, they'd give over to the disciples and then they would distribute them to help those that were in need. And apparently Barnabas has just done that. And I'm sure he's received all kinds of praise for his generosity. Well, guess what happens next? A man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira, they decide to sell their field as well. Awesome, quite admirable. What exactly was involved with them giving up this piece of property? Well, chances are this piece of property was, in, in essence, a security blanket. It was an investment. It was their retirement. The Hebrews called this their ketubah, which was a dowry for his wife in case he died prematurely or in case of a divorce. This was a pile of money that was sitting there that would care for his wife to take care of her. So they wanted to give to the church, but they also wanted to make sure that Sapphira was covered. And so they came up with this plan of, of, of taking the, the proceeds and dividing them in half. Half's going to go to the church, and half's going to go to, to ensure that Sapphira was okay. And so that they do this. But the text tells us there was nothing wrong with this decision. After all, it was their money. Well, let's see what happens. Where things start going south, where poor Ananias and Sapphira, they make the decision to do this, but they tell the apostles that the proceeds that they have is all that they got from, from the land. So let's see what happens. Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 2. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, was it the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. So what Peter is doing here is he is, is describing the spiritual battle that, that's being waged within Ananias' heart. He said, you've been going back and forth over this, and, and I hate which side you landed on. Matthew chapter 6, and verse 21 Jesus describes that our pocketbook, you know, our, our monies and, and our possessions, that they can also be equated with our heart. The two are almost interchangeable. So I, I hope that you'll give me a little bit of latitude this morning because I took the liberty of exchanging these terms. And let's see how this text changes. With his wise full knowledge, he kept back part of his heart for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled you that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself some of your heart? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied to men, but to God. You know, even his name, Ananias, means God is gracious. How do you respond to the goodness of God? How do you respond to the graciousness of God? How do you respond to his mercy, his grace? What, how do you respond to that? Will you completely turn your heart over to God? Ananias and Sapphira pretended this is exactly what I've done. But in reality, they held back for their own, and it cost them their lives. I want to be clear. What God is looking for is not the right outward trappings. And if you're getting that feeling this morning that I, I, I just don't measure up, I don't do enough, I don't give enough, I'm somehow not good enough in, in what I'm doing, those are all externals. And those are voices of condemnation that come from Satan. But in reality, what he's trying to do is to make you feel defeated, that you'll never measure up. But God is simply looking for a heart that beats for him. Because if the heart is right, everything else is going to be taken care of. Amen? Isn't it? If we get the heart right and it begins there, 
it starts overflowing into how our life starts to look. Ezekiel 36 is a very powerful chapter in Scripture. And Ezekiel, along with his fellow countrymen, are, are over in Babylon, and they're spread out all over the place, and they, they've been in exile. In fact, Ezekiel gets his calling while he's there. And God sends his prophet a message. He said, please, go tell the people something exciting is about to happen. And he tells them that for his name's sake, not because of what they've done, but for his name's sake, he's going to bring them back and restore them out of bondage and return them to their homeland. Ezekiel 36 and verse 24 says this, For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back to your homeland. I will sprinkle clean water over you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities from your idols. I will give you a new heart, put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. You will then live in the land I gave your forefathers. You will be my people and I will be your God. You know, when you get to the point where you just say, I'm done. God, I, I have tried to kind of live in both worlds. God, I've, I, I've tried to do it under my own strength. I, I, I'm done holding back. I'm done trying to protect my interests. I'm done trying to, to, to keep back a, a portion of my life. I just want to give it all to you. The angels start rejoicing because God then gives you something more, more valuable than gold or silver. He gives you a heart. And in the Bible, the, the heart is symbolic of the want to and then the can to. So when his heart gets put within us, it gives us a desire and ability, a, a desire for things that he wants in our lives. It gives us the ability to actually accomplish those things that we can't have until their heart is placed in us. We can try, but we're going to fail. And we, we try again, but if it's under our strength, it's not going to happen. Because we still have desires out in the world. But if a heart comes from God, he gives us the want to and the can to. So when God talks about giving us a new heart, he gives us these new desires and abilities. So things begin to change. I like how Max Lucado writes this. He said, grace becomes more than just a word to describe what God did for us, the one-time event. But more about what he is doing inside of us. He moves in. Isn't that a great analogy? He moves in and takes over. And he removes your heart, poison as it is, with pride and with pain and all the mistakes of the past. And places within you this new heart that comes from him. Colossians 1.27, Paul talks about this great mystery of Christ in you, the hope of glory. Todd and Tara Storch know this reality all too familiarly. The Storches and their three children went on a family vacation to go skiing up at Beaver Creek in Colorado in March of 2010, having the time of their lives. And as they were going down the last run of the day, on the last day of their trip, their 13-year-old daughter, Taylor, lost control and tumbled down backwards and slid into a tree, which she was immediately taken to the hospital to no avail. The doctors came and told Todd and Tara that their daughter would not survive. And after that, they were informed by the hospital officials that their daughter was a perfect candidate to be an organ donor. Her parents had only a few moments to decide what to do. Taylor had lived her life with joy and brought happiness to all that knew her. And Todd and Tara knew what their daughter would want them to do. And so they agreed to let Taylor give the gift of life through organ donation. Meanwhile, in Arizona, Patricia Winters, a 39-year-old mother of two, was on her last leg. She had struggled for five years with cardiomyopathy, a condition that degenerated to the point where she was sleeping over 18 hours a day and unable to care for her two boys. Winters was selected to be the recipient of Taylor Storch's heart, in a transplant surgery that took place in Tucson. But Tara, Taylor's mother, desired some closure. And she was happy that different organs were able to go all over the country and help 
changed so many different people's lives. But she desired to reconnect somehow with her late daughter, if only through the beating of her heart. Well, a neighbor got on the internet and started searching and searching and finally found out, found an article that talked about a heart transplant that took place roughly about the time of Taylor's accident. So in September, six months after Taylor's death, the Storches made contact with the Winters and Patricia and her husband invited Todd and Tara to fly out from Dallas to Phoenix to come spend some time with them. And after they arrived, the two couples got together in the room and they talked and they hugged and they cried and got to know each other better. Patricia shared with the Storches that Tater's heart was a good heart. It was a strong heart and allowed her to live life in a way she had never been able to before the heart transplant. When the two men left the room, Tara made a request of Patricia. She asked, could I just lay my head next to your chest? See, my daughter and I were very, very close, and I used to climb in bed and snuggle with her. Here's how she describes what happens next. So I got to lay my head on her chest. What was magical was while I was doing that, her heart just had this huge kick, and Patricia said, did you hear that? I said, yes, I did. Then it did it again, this huge kick. And I looked at Patricia and she said, I was praying while you were lying on my chest that Taylor would give you a sign she was here. And she did. I'll never forget that. It was truly a gift of Taylor letting me know that she was here. Here's a question for us this morning. When Tara leaned in and listened, whose heart did she hear? Was it not the still beating heart of her daughter, Taylor? Oh, dear child of God, when our Heavenly Father leans in and listens to our heart, is it not the still beating heart of Jesus Christ that he hears inside of each one of us? See, when we die to ourselves, we give our heart over to him, he returns the favor and puts within us the heart of his son, Jesus. It's a good heart. It's a strong heart. It's a heart that allows us to do things we've never been able to do under our own strength. Because that's the mystery of our faith that's described in the Gospels. Jesus inside of me. And it's no longer I who live, but Christ who's living where? In me. You've heard this. Yeah. Day by day, Jesus takes over more and more of what's rightfully his. And things begin to, to change. Our emotions, our temperament, our thoughts begin to change. And as we start looking in the mirror, I, I realize that I don't think the way I used to think. I, I don't hate the way I used to think. And you know, I'm not as critical as I used to be because Christ is living in me. I'm not perfect, but Christ has taken over more and more. And we become more and more like Jesus Christ from one degree of glory to the next. That's what takes place. Proverbs 4.23 describes the heart as the wellspring of our life. My prayer for each one of us this morning is that Jesus starts overflowing out of our hearts into the world that's desperately in need of his love. Where are you this morning? Are, are you still like the soldiers trying to hold that arm and sword as high as you can, trying to remain control, saying, God, I'm going to give you part, but I, I've still got some stuff. I'm... Or are you willing to drop your hands, blow the water, feel it pour over your entire body, and just say, God, I'm done. I'm ready to give you my heart. Take it. Because at that point, that's when he can give us his son heart that gets put inside of us. This morning, if you'd like to respond to him and start living that life that he's always dreamed for you to live, we invite you to come now as we stand and as we sing. Merciful Savior.